And we're joined once again tonight by Virginia Postrel, columnist for Bloomberg View and the author of The Substance of Style and the Future and Its Enemies. This is the second installment in our four-part look at individuals in a changing world. Picking up on our conversation from yesterday about room in the group for individual differences, tonight we turn to what Virginia calls a variety revolution. Hi again. Hi. In your book, The Substance of Style, you refer to a variety revolution. What do you mean by that term? Well, if you go back to uh, the mid-20th century, at that time, uh, the sort of culmination of 100 years of uh, economic progress was about getting everybody to not bad. Having uh, what Holiday Inn in the 70s called the best surprise is no surprise. Uniformity, reliability, consistency of goods and services. And that was real progress because if you had been on the road in the days before chains like Holiday Inn and you pulled off the road to a motel, chances were your surprise was not going to be a happy surprise. It was not <laughs> going to be, oh, this is a fabulous B&B. &B. <laughs> uh, let, let's, let's come back here for, uh, for a second honeymoon. What has happened really starting in the 80s and accelerating uh, and becoming ever more noticeable is we've gone from that world where we have consistency to a world where we have more and more and more variety. And uh, it's variety of goods, it's variety of services, with, however, still a certain expectation of quality. And this has come from a number of different sources. Partly it's because of the global, uh, globalized world. Uh, the number of countries that we import coffee from or beer from has gone up, not to mention you know, garments, silk. Mm. Uh, it's come from a variety of increasing variety of ethnic cultures within um, North America, certainly also Europe, you know, other, other places. And uh, the, not only a variety of ethnic cultures, but an appreciation of them so that not everybody is trying to be, pretend that they are the dominant culture. Uh, it's come from the internet. Uh, suddenly, it used to be if you lived in even a medium-sized city, you didn't have access to that many goods and services because there just weren't enough people in your town to support distributing something that was unusual. It could be unusual furniture, it could be unusually sized clothes, whatever. Uh, now, uh, through the internet, even before that, through catalogs, you were able to aggregate mm. the all the people in the smaller places into one big market and therefore cover the costs of that distribution and the and the cost of distribution went down. So there are a lot of different causes. The result is a proliferation of choice. Uh, a proliferation of choice from of everything from drawer pulls to uh, to wedding cake designs. Uh, we are used to having at our fingertips uh, the ability to find the exact thing that we think we want. Well, let me ask you this. Given that we have so much choice in so many areas of our life, has it affected our definition of quality? Well, I think it, that's a very interesting question. I think it has affected our definition of quality because it, instead of quality merely being meeting a certain agreed upon standard, we also have the idea that quality is not just that the thing works, it's that it matches my identity. It matches me in some deeper way. Uh, it, it pleases me, I like that. It says something about who I am. I'm like that, uh, pleasure and meaning as well as function. And if you think of the sort of functions of design, those are the three aspects of design. So variety may have given us uh, more, if I can put it that way, as individuals, but is there a point where this variety revolution conflicts with what's good for the market? Well, companies are constantly adjusting their variety. It seems like every three or four years I read something about Procter & Gamble decide they have too many varieties, now they're gonna have fewer, or uh, you know, this chain of stores has decided as not enough variety, it's gonna add to it. Uh, they're always trying to get that sweet spot where you have exactly the right amount to, to please people, but also to cover your costs. 
And then the other thing that uh, is for an individual, as much as you want the thing that exactly matches you and as much as you want the advantages of variety, you also don't want the, the sort of psychological costs of too much variety. It can become overwhelming. Uh, in the 1984 movie uh, Moscow on the Hudson, uh, Robin Williams plays a, a Soviet musician who defects in Bloomingdale's and then comes from the world of the very constrained world of uh, the planned economy of the Soviet Union in those days to this, to us today, not that abundant world, but to mm -hmm. him, abundant world. And he's staying with a family and he, they send him shopping for coffee and he goes into the supermarket aisle and is completely overwhelmed and the coffee he he pulls the coffee down on top of him and ends up in the hospital because he can't deal with the variety and sometimes i think we feel like that but and this is the very important thing that does not mean that choice is bad or variety is bad it means that we need ways of navigating the choices, and those have started to proliferate. They should do a sequel to the movie, bring the 1984 Robin <laughs> Williams uh, to modern day to 2011. Um, you've argued in your writings on variety that we can, one of the central thesis is that we can live better on the same income because of the abundance of choices today. Explain that to right. me. Well, you can find, um, when you can better match what you really want, with your budget, uh, you get more what economists call utility. You you can you you don't, in a sense, waste your money on things that are not really what you want. The food you really want, the the clothes you don't, you're less likely to have to buy you know the clothes that aren't quite right for you. Or, um, so holding income constant, mm. you get more choice. More more a better fit, a better fit. And this goes back to this idea uh, that we we're talking about yesterday where I say nobody's normal, that there's this heterogeneity of people. And the real value of having all this variety is not for its own sake. It's not because, oh, 10 choices is better than one choice in some broad sense uh, that works your philosophical muscles. I mean, there are people who argue that, but I would argue that the real advantage is that it, it allows the accommodation of individual difference. But how can, how can we measure, I guess empirically, the, the benefit of variety? Is there a way? Well, it's very complicated. There are, there have a few um, economists have done measurements. Mm. Um, uh, the data are not super great. They don't lend themselves to these kinds of econometric studies. But there have been some studies uh, there was one on the uh, availability of imported uh, of, of imports of uh, different varieties from different sources of countries and and these are very crude this is like wine from France versus wine from Portugal it's not about this specific bottle of wine and they found that the the value was the equivalent of three percent of US GDP which is enormous uh, people being able to find what they want. Uh, another thing that has evolved is when we talk about too much variety or, or overwhelming variety is you're starting to have uh, an emphasis on inter intermediaries, uh, finding people who help or technologies that help narrow down the choices so that you know you no longer have to live in a major metropolitan area to ever see an old movie, which used to be the case. Uh, now you can get them from Netflix, get them from Amazon, both of which have, or whatever other services, uh, which have also ways of suggesting you liked these movies, here's another one you might like based on, on your preferences, helping you find sources. Uh, we have this expansion of wedding planners. Everybody wants to have their special day. People don't get married that often, so they don't have <laughs> a lot of practice with this uh, sorting through all this choice. Um, here is an, uh, a, a relatively new occupation uh, in terms of the middle class, certainly, uh, of people who help narrow down, the, they get to know you, they help narrow down the choices 
to ones that suit you, and then you choose from those, as opposed to choosing from the universe of you know millions. And there's of trust choices. in that relationship, and there's trust. There's a there's a kind of knowledge. So there are technological fixes, and then there's also ones with the, more of the human touch. So let's talk about your critics, or critics of what you're saying, at least critics of consumerism say that you know all of this might be great in one sense, but really it's just too much. We can't we can't handle it. It overwhelms us. It distracts us from what we really want, which is perhaps that simpler time or that conformity. What do you say to critics who say it's just, it's too much, all this variety, 40,000 choices of produce in a superstore? You know, well, well, I would say, first of all, that I mean, while, while there are psychology experiments that show uh, that people can be overwhelmed by choices, uh, those same experiments, those same papers show that people don't want somebody else to choose, that they prefer, uh, they might prefer, uh, six rather than 30 choices, but they don't want zero. Um, the other thing is that people, and people as individuals, uh, institutions, organizations, and society in general, evolve ways of helping sort through the variety, helping people to make these matches. Um, whether it is you know, online dating services to talk about another kind of variety mm -hmm. that, we, that we take for granted or uh, you know, it, it's it's not it's not this variety revolution is not just about consumerism, it's not just about products. That's where it's easiest to see. It's actually it's about art, it's about music, it's about religion, it's about you know who you marry, it's about where you live. It's it's an expansion of individual choice and opportunity as a way of you know finding the best expression of who you are. Yesterday we talked a little bit about how things are playing out between the individual and the group in, in different cultures. I want to ask you, I mean, we're in this conversation about choice and variety. We're North Americans. We live in, in a place that politically, socially, mostly economically, we have the luxury of the right. variety of choice. And how does the proliferation of variety in the West, if I can call it the West, affect those countries that, you know, where people still have fewer options? Well, one way it affects them is that in many cases they're involved in producing for this. I mean, if you think about the uh, great growth of China and India, sure. other parts, uh, smaller countries in Asia as well, uh, they're actually helping to drive this uh, through through uh, manufacturing, uh, but also through uh, even in the sort of less westernizing. I mean, one of the things that we have access to is of uh, something like there's this chain, this small chain called 10,000 Villages, right. which is hand, cra hand, hand crafts hand. from uh, you know, less developed countries. Uh, that is possible because of all, first of all, that is an increase in variety and mm. it is an increase in people's search for things that are special, which is one of the things that people want when they have so much choice finding the thing that's really special becomes even more valuable. Um, so there's there's that effect, and then I think those places as well, um, you know, variety is it's something of a luxury good, but it's not as 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 the market as a whole becomes globalized and you can spread the costs of it over more people, it becomes less of a luxury good. You said it goes beyond objects. It goes to things like our careers and, and lifestyle choice. Absolutely. And we certainly see it in people that are younger than you and I about <laughs> when they say, you know, they'll have six jobs throughout their career and I'm bored of this and I want to go do this, so I'm going to go do that. But, you know, again, social scientists, uh, critics say that this is breeding discontent amongst uh, people. So how do you respond to well, that? Well, I think to some degree human beings are just by nature discontent. <laughs> I mean, okay. I mean, if, if you go back, I've, I've read a great deal of the social criticism uh, from the mid 20th century, the 50s and 60s, and there, uh, the great criticism of uh, U.S. society in particular was conformity. Oh, it's so terrible! Everybody is a conformist. Everybody is. Uh, we talk too much about belonging. Uh, everybody wants to do the same thing. Um, there was uh, a lot of, of reaction against that. And this was, uh, it manifests itself in a lot of different ways. There were right-wing versions, there were left-wing versions, there were non-political versions. Uh, and poof, out we come on the other end of that. And now everybody wants to be a non-conformist. <laughs> uh, and 
the truth is individuals want to find a balance for themselves and that where that sweet spot is differs for different people and when the wherever the dominant sort of balance is in society there will be people who feel left out of that so that that's part of it and then also we we want to improve I mean this is what drives progress uh, is that notion that you know this glass is nice but it could be better or uh, this this technology is good but it could be better well it's also the case that we say you know this this society is good but it could be better and that manifests itself in various kinds of social criticism we are going to talk about progress later, later in the week but I want to ask you this do you see a variety revolution happening in things that are perhaps a little more intangible than consumer goods, things like politics and governance. Do you see that happening? Well, in politics and governance, it's a little tricky because it's sort of like saying, uh, do you find variety in soccer or variety in basketball? Because politics is structured by whatever the rules of the game are. So, you know, there are many people in the U.S. who are always like, oh, it's so terrible, we only have two parties, you know, we should have more parties, third parties never get anywhere. Well, the reason is because the constitutional design is a certain way, and the math works out that you have two competing parties. Uh, that said, you may not have a variety of candidates, but you have a proliferation, for example, of media. So instead of lot, you know, just what's now called the MSM, mainstream media, uh, you have you know, bloggers and you have alternatives and uh, the, the cost, it's just like goods, the cost of distribution and production have dropped dramatically. So it's not necessarily good for people like us who want to make a living in the media, but, but in terms of the individual consumer of political news, political opinion, et cetera, there's a lot more variety than there used to be. Okay, we'll pick up our conversation again tomorrow. Thanks a lot, Virginia. Thank you.